Integrating trees on your land provides a multitude of benefits to livestock, biodiversity and reducing carbon emissions. Andrew Barber and his family farm at Mains of Fincastle, an upland organic beef and sheep farm in Highland Perthshire. Andrew runs a herd of Shorthorn Cross cattle and Texel Cross commercial sheep on a pasture-based system rising to 1,500 feet above sea level. The Shorthorn cattle beast is, we're looking for a medium-sized cow and one that's not going to cost too much to keep in winter will survive on the relatively poor grazings. The bulk of the farm is rough grazings. We use uh, the white bread short tone as a good milky animal, as a very docile animal, and we use the limousine as a terminal sire to put a bit of size into the calves that go. The farm runs on a rotational grazing system, and there's two rhythms to it, I suppose you could say. There's, uh, in the winter, the uh, sheep are on the high ground, which is where the cattle graze in the summer months. And these, all these grasslands are designated for their natural history value. So we keep the sheep off them in the summertime and cattle just graze those. The sheep are in the summer months are on the in-by, uh, on in-by fields and we rotate them. We move them every three, five days uh, around the farm. And that's about getting best grass growth. Um, and then the cattle come back in and at the moment they're being uh, they're down onto the lower ground through the winter months and in a shed type of, type of system. So we were thinking of putting getting more trees on the farm really uh, driven initially by well two things I suppose. One was um, we realized the animals actually benefited from having trees on the farm. They were using woodland and the woods that we had already already got on the farm, when we opened those up to the animals, the animals chose to use them and we were kind of al alive to that. We were wanting to replace the shelter belts which were starting to blow down, so we knew we had to get more shelter on the farm. But we were also trying to deal with the fact that these little shelter belts were too small in their on their own to manage them easily and for commercial purposes. So it made sense to us to try and plant bigger woodlands but we didn't want to lose ground to the farm, so we, planned, we, we planted them in ways that would allow animals to graze through them. Um, but it was originally driven by uh, the, our interest in, I suppose, the way the animals were behaving, animal behaviour, animal welfare. We've got about, uh, the way we're managing it just now, just shy of about 30 hectares on the farm. And on our estimations, that um, soaks up about a third of the emissions coming off the livestock. Soils and the way we manage soils, according to agriculture, takes off another third. We would expand up to, um, we would double the amount of woodland very happily to, for carbon management reasons, also animal behaviour reasons too. Yeah, this farm could cope with a lot more woodland. So the species we've concentrated on have been pine uh, and the broadleaves, trees that will allow a grass sward to keep going under the canopy. The ones that were originally planted here were very traditional um, uh, pine. The ones that are still standing are dominated by pine, um, though there's a little bit of larch and Norway spruce, some sycamore through them. The, the one that blew down was a spruce wood, and that's actually the one that the animals didn't particularly want to use. It was too dark for them. Cows have grown up with trees, they evolved in woodland, and trees have evolved with animals like cattle, and they cope with it perfectly well. Uh, this is about producing a timber crop as well as uh, an animal crop off, off this ground. Yeah, that, that's been our idea and the approach. Um, so the species, the main species we've had our eye on for that is oak. Uh, it's a long-term crop. It's not a short-term crop like Sitka, but it's, it's a long-term one, but it's a valuable one. Integrating trees in suitable areas of your farm can bring many benefits to cattle, sheep and improving biodiversity. On the cattle side, cattle like being in woodland. It, it meets their behavioural needs um, for all sorts of things. Itching, they're, they're certainly leaf fodder as well is an important part for them. Um, from a nutritional point of view, if they can get access to it, they choose that. I suppose the modern idea of welfare with the idea of adaptive behaviour means that animals can choose the environment to meet their needs and trees are, are part of that, certainly for cattle. For sheep, it's a bit different. Sheep's not a woodland animal, um, as folks will well know, and, uh, but they choose to go in amongst trees 
for two reasons. Either because there's a grass sward underneath the trees and trees will bring on grass earlier in the season. So it gives us spring grass earlier than we get outside of trees. And that's the effect of a tree canopy on grass growth. So sheep will go in for that. They'll also go in to thermoregulate. They're, they're sensitive to temperature. And you see that in the winter months, they will choose to go in under trees on a cold night. On a, on a warmer night, they'll be outside. And for the sheep in the winter time, if they've got access to shelter, studies that people have known for a long time that they will use much less energy just to maintain themselves, just keep their body heat up. And that will save, well, the sums we've done here in the past anyway have suggested about a six pound a head saving on sheep feed costs. Um, so that's one benefit. Cattle, there's all sorts of benefits. They just like being in amongst trees. Um, browsing, uh, itching, rubbing. They just like behaviourally, they just like that place to be. And they go in to get out the sun um, and to get in out the rain. Well, the environmental benefits are, are, are many. And what you're doing is, I suppose, in sort of ecological terms, is providing an extra bit of structure to the farm which mightn't be there otherwise um, so uh, and that variety of shade and light is good for um, certain types of plant communities um, but it's really that structural diversity that that trees bring and uh, the older the tree the more uh, the more the benefit I suppose. Planting trees isn't for everyone and consideration must be given to the land and farming system. For Andrew, trees are very much a positive step forward for the future, suiting his upland livestock system and contributing to net zero targets. If you recognise, as we certainly recognise, that uh, you've got to get um, towards net zero, then you're going to include trees as part of the solution. It's as there's very few other choices. Um, if you've got the ability to grow trees, you're daft not to. Certainly don't be frightened about integrating the two, You'll give, it gives long-term benefits. The only negatives are short-term and you've got to think about how you manage around that period when you need to exclude stock, if it's stock that you're farming. Um, but the, 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 the gains are very, very positive. Um, in, in the medium term, definitely in the long term for sure. Short term, it's all about how you manage around the that initial period of conflict when trees are sensitive to being browsed. Our wish would be to expand it, the kind of systems that we've been running here, but we're quite constrained, particularly this end of the farm, because of the, uh, the um, nature designations on the farm, trees are seen, seen as bad news. But that's because trees are always seen as in terms of a plantation model rather than a more open grown model. So our aim is to have every grazing block with access to woodland for shelter purposes and increasingly that shelter in summertime as well as winter months. Carbon markets and the trading of carbon credits is currently a hot topic in Scotland's land-based sector. We spoke to Pat Snowden from Scottish Forestry to unearth the facts about carbon markets and provide clear guidance to farmers, crofters and land managers. Hi, my name's Pat Snowden and I work for Scottish Forestry, which is the government body in Scotland that uh, regulates uh, the forest sector and also develops policy for forestry. Well, the Woodland Carbon Code is a standard for uh, developing carbon credits from planting new woodlands. And it's important because the carbon market uh, has to adhere to strict rules in order to ensure confidence um, for people buying carbon credits that they actually get the carbon that they've paid for and that it's all properly monitored and measured and it represents a genuine addition to tackling climate change. A carbon credit, in simple terms, it's a tonne of CO2 or the equivalent to that. And a carbon credit is a commodity that people can buy and sell. So if you want, if you're a company wanting to reduce your carbon footprint, you can obviously reduce your emissions. That's really important. That's the first thing you could do. But in addition to that, for emissions you can't reduce or are difficult to reduce, you can buy what are called carbon credits, which is an offset, a way to offset your, your carbon footprint. And that can be added into your greenhouse gas account, if you like, to actually help you become net zero. 
Well, the first thing to say about the wooden carbon code is it's, it's a type of carbon credit which re represents a removal of greenhouse gases from the atmosphere, and, and that's really important in terms of tackling net zero. So it's not trying to reduce emissions or avoid emissions, so it's actually taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. Now, initially, when you plant a new woodland, um, you've got nothing to show because the trees haven't yet grown. But you will have done an estimate of how much um, CO2 your woodland will have sequestered over time, and that will give you a number. So you could, for example, plant a woodland that will, over the next 50 years, sequester 10,000 tonnes of CO2. And at that point, we call those pending issuance units, those 10,000 tonnes. So they, they are a credit, if you like, uh, but it's a promise to deliver at that point. Now, as the trees grow, um, you need to monitor and verify the growth of the woodland. And as you do that, you can actually convert those pending issuance units into what we call woodland carbon units. And these are verified credits. And it's only at the point of verification that you can actually use the credits against your carbon footprint. So there's two types, there's the PIUs and there's the WCUs. Well, the carbon market is subject to a lot of um, criticism and debate about its integrity. And buyers, you know, companies purchasing credits are particularly concerned about this because they're very alive to accusations of greenwash. So they want to know if they purchase a carbon credit, A, that the credit really does genuinely exist, that it will be put away in permanence, it's a permanent credit, it won't be reversed, um, also that it provides an additional contribution towards tackling climate change. And they also want confidence that um, it's properly monitored and verified throughout its lifetime and that there's complete transparency about who owns the credits and whether or not they've been used, so to avoid any risks of double counting or double use by different companies. So for all those reasons, the Wooden Carbon Code is a really important standard to actually provide that confidence and trust in, in the carbon market. If farmers or crofters are thinking about starting a Woodland Carbon Code project, there are a number of factors to consider. They need to think about you know, areas of their farm uh, that may be suitable for planting trees. And Andrew's just given some really interesting examples of how um, he has managed to integrate woodlands into his farm. Um, but there is plenty of advice and support available for this as well. Um, so there's a whole host of what we call intermediaries who are essentially the link between the buyers of carbon credits and the farmers and landowners who want to grow the trees. And they can provide advice on the types of trees you might want to grow. Uh, there's a number of tools available through forest research which will help you assess different sites and what types of species might be available. And all this information is available on the Wooden Carbon Code website. Woodlands provide a fantastic opportunity to generate additional benefits for your farm. And I think Andrew has set those out brilliantly in the way it benefits his livestock on the farm and provides real monetary savings. But beyond that, um, it, there are two ways in which farmers can actually use carbon credits. They can either use them against their own carbon footprint, so they actually retain the credits, they don't sell them, and they can use that as, as a, use these certified credits to actually provide proof that they have uh, offset the, any remaining emissions that they can't reduce on their farm. Alternatively, they can sell them to a buyer, and, uh, and that provides a revenue stream and they can either sell all the credits up front at the beginning of the cycle or they could sell them as they verify credits during the uh, life cycle of the woodland or they could do a bit of both. It, it's entirely up to them what they want to do. So they could make it into a fairly regular uh, income stream. But there's two ways that farm, farmers have a choice really. They can either use the credits themselves or they can sell them to, to buyers and then generate a revenue stream from it. At the moment, the prices have been going up quite significantly um, and while we don't systematically collect all data on carbon prices, um, our evidence suggests it's about £20 per tonne of CO2 at the moment. But we are aware of cases where it's up to 40 or above for some projects. So the, the price will vary uh, depending on the cost of planting the woodland and in many cases on the, the types of woodlands that have been generated because some buyers are very keen to buy credits that are associated with high areas of biodiversity, biodiversity value and uh, mixed broadleaf woodlands and they may pay extra for these uh, types of credits. We do hold regular events about the Woodland Carbon Code, typically webinars since uh, we had the pandemic the last few years, but we are keen also to attend uh, in-person events and we recently held one for the Integrating Trees Network and we'll be doing more of these and uh, you know, if people have suggestions about events they'd like us to speak at we'd be very happy to do that.
If you'd like to find out more about the Woodland Carbon Code, please visit woodlandcarboncode.org.uk.